what does history tell us about coronaviruses? Well, until SARS-CoV-2, we had four endemic coronaviruses that caused colds. SARS-CoV-2 will obviously be the fifth. The youngest is OC43, which researchers believe jumped from cows to humans sometime in the late 1800s. This is also the same time as the Russian flu, working its way around the world. So perhaps that flu was actually a coronavirus. If so, OC43 caused a lot more problems back then than it does now, especially if the humans were older and naive to the virus, according to the news reports that you can find in various papers from the time. But by now, we've all had multiple infections with OC43 and its variants from when we were kids to today, where we usually feel terrible for a few days or maybe a week. Over time, the virus does mutate towards becoming more benign and infectious, but that usually takes a long time. Anyway, it serves as a useful roadmap for what might happen to us in our biological dance with this new unwelcome visitor. We also know that immunity to these respiratory viruses wanes over time, either with natural infections or vaccines. The only way you can develop better immunity is through booster shots or infections. But what we really care about, ending up in the hospital, is focused almost entirely on the non-immune. This is a nasty bug. It affects the obese and elderly the most, and it isn't going anywhere. It has definitely killed hundreds of thousands of Americans. So this gets us to the important policy considerations. If we know that it's endemic, which was obvious over a year ago, then how should we approach our public health? Obviously, the only point of slowing the spread at this time is if you could get those without any immunity, no infection and no vaccine, vaccinated to minimize the number of people clogging up our hospitals. But you can't get to a vaccination rate that will stop the spread of the virus. There is no herd immunity threshold, no number of vaccinated and immune to perfectly prevent its spread. Besides the fact that your ability to slow the spread is questionable anyway, it just doesn't make a difference in the end. We're all going to get this virus. Somewhere there's a date with you and me with this virus. Whether you've been vaccinated or not, you will most assuredly get infected. If you have some immunity through a vaccine or previous natural infection, you're much less likely to get very sick. So mandating vaccines, if we agree that it was wise and just, wouldn't matter much except to those who are vaccinated. It may slow the spread and delay the next time they're exposed, but they'll still get it in when their immunity wanes, and again and again. If your mitigation measures worked, all you do right now is extend the time it takes for everyone to get immunity, unless you believe you can convince those who won't get immunized to get the vaccine. Even so, that only really benefits those who've chosen to not protect themselves while inconveniencing everyone else and taking away a lot of rights and simple joys of life. It's easy to see how we got here. Mission creep is not just something that happens in the military. It happens in public policy too. By believing that we could prevent people from getting infected, we've embarked on a strategy that is unwinnable and with no clear endpoint. There's a preponderance of evidence that people can get reinfected multiple times with COVID and after vaccination. Both through research and observational data, we know that infections with SARS-CoV-2 will continue to happen forever, whether you're vaccinated or not, whether you have had it before or in recovered, and no matter where in the world you live.